and a very warm welcome to Advance HE's EDI Conference Day 2. I'm very, very pleased to be able to invite you to join us this morning. We have got some really important and serious issues to discuss today. And our conference theme, as you know, is courageous conversations and adventurous approaches using our creative thinking in tackling inequality. And never has there been a more important time for us to do that. I think what's really interesting is, you know, as we see equality, diversity and inclusion becoming more and more embedded in institutional values and strategy, which is a real pleasure to see, I have to see. Um, and it also becomes then more of a measure of the student's experience and student success. And this is really important that we we link all these things together. And as we see this, you know, we also see institutional interest in much more creative approaches to tackling inequality. So whether we're looking at tackling new issues or those which are stubbornly um, resistant to change and stubbornly persistent, um, as a sector, I believe, and I would say this, wouldn't I, that it's really important that we can seek inspiration, insight, guidance and, and sharing of good practice and learning from each other as we navigate this, this territory and, and actually some new territories, because this conference particularly is really designed to start talking about some of those issues and areas which may have been considered taboo in the past, um, part of the undiscussables, the unmentionables. And, and I think it's really important that we surface all of those issues and we really begin to look at all of the all of all of the issues and challenges which affect anybody in terms of being disadvantaged or excluded in any way. So topics like decolonisation, the menopause, um, gender-based violence and so on and so forth um, are really beginning to have a place in the conversations that we're having. So creating that space is really important. And I think when we start linking a policy to practice, that's the how to. How can we make these changes happen? Really, really important. It's conferences like this that can refresh our perspectives, re-energise us, send us back to work um, with some new insight, inspiration, thinking or ideas. So, as I said, a, you know, a general focus for our conversation has been about or will be about breaking those taboos, leading change and the positive action that we can really take. I think one area where we have to be particularly courageous at the moment, and I'm seeing that happening, I'm delighted to say, is in the whole issue of race and anti-racism. And I would just like to draw your attention, of course, to the Race Equality Charter, which is a whole institutional approach to tackling uh, racism. And the, what differentiates it, of course, from the Athena Swan Charter is there's also an element which looks at pedagogy and the curriculum, which is increasingly important. And I do hope that you are engaging with the phase two of the REC. We've just had two major reviews and we're going to take all the learning that we've had from Athena Swan to uh, make it less burdensome, make it more streamlined, make it more relevant and an approachable charter for you to use. And we are we're going to be running engagement sessions around how we take forward the development of the race equality charter. So I would encourage you to engage with that. I can't actually do an introduction to a conference like this kind of without mentioning the C word, COVID. And, you know, I think the biggest worry about COVID is how it seems to have amplified many of the inequalities in the world. And, you know, there are some real worries that, for example, you know, the Secretary General of the United Nations mentioned fairly recently, there's a real risk that it would set back gender equality by 50 years unless we really start tackling the evidence which is emerging to show that this is already beginning to happen. But it's not just gender, it's virtual working, the impact on the home environment, learning and teaching, digital poverty, a whole range of issues have been surfaced by this. And, you know, these issues are there. The, the, the positive benefit of the pandemic has really brought it to the forefront for everybody um, and we can't ignore it and it's created that opportunity to really tackle these issues now and with the strength that we have in the room the virtual room today amongst yourselves with your shared passion commitment roles and responsibilities in this there's nothing like critical mass and momentum to bring about change so I'm very excited about what um, I hope and can see will emerge from attendance at this conference today. 
Um, there are a number of themes over the next two days of the conference. Um, and and I, it, I think what's good about that gives you the choice to think about which theme or, or which themes do I really want to focus on. We've got equality, diversity, inclusion and leadership, belonging and safe space, bridging the gaps, um, particularly looking at pay gaps and a whole range of issues to support that. Thinking forward, um, how are we going to really grasp this opportunity strategically as well as practically to bring about changes and skills building for EDI change agents? How do we secure and make these things happen in the institution? So um, I think very exciting two days ahead. I hear yesterday was a, a great success. And now it's my very great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker today. We're absolutely delighted that uh, Professor Jeff Thompson, MBE, MBE, founder and chair of the Youth Charter, has been able to come and speak to us today. Good morning and welcome, Jeff. Good morning. If I read Jeff's biography to you, um, I'm afraid I'd take up most of his session. But Jeff has got a 35 year track record um, working in the field of social and human development, always looking and searching for gaining that what seems sometimes to be elusiveness of equality for everybody. He has a list of board memberships, honorary doctorships, um, has been. Uh, a member of the Royal Society of the Arts, and he's five-time world karate champion. I didn't know that, Jeff. <laughs> um, so a, a huge amount of experience. He's been listed as the top 100 BAME leaders in the UK and the Evening Standards, top 1,000 influencers in London, and so on and so on. Jeff, we're very fortunate, um, very lucky to have you with us today. Thank you for giving us our time, and we're really looking forward to hearing what you have to say to us. Jeff's going to speak for about 20 to 25 minutes, then there'll be about 10 to 15 minutes for questions. If you'd like to put your questions in the chat box, um, I will field them with Jeff afterwards. Jeff, the floor is yours, and a very warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Madison. And everyone in the digital interactive world in which we now live and exist every single day, it really is a pleasure for me to join you. I'd like to thank Advance HE for the opportunity to address you and hopefully take you into a space where you can believe the art of the possible is born out of challenge, because that's what we face, challenges, significant challenges. We're going to look at the challenges we're going to look at the opportunities. I'm going to tell you a story because story changes lives. And then I'm going to present to you an opportunity where everyone that is clearly here because they're interested in change, what it looks like in its equal, diverse and inclusiveness in a fair, just and tolerant society and world. But more importantly, how do we become courageous, creative and adventurous? Because I believe that the HE sector is ideally positioned to do just that and to bring about really sustainable and impactful change. The cerebral is about images, the interactive world that we are now engaged with and over just under a year has given us moments in time that will see our lives change. They will change irreparably for the good, but before there is good, there is bad. Climate justice, social justice, Everything you see in these images have shaped and informed what I'm going to share with you. Because on May 25th last year, Jeff Thompson became a black man, a vulnerable black man, unsure of himself after all I've achieved in my incredible journey, but ultimately having to revisit, reflect and recommit myself to what these challenges represent and the opportunities provide. Because I believe that if we are only single-minded in our cultural and equality perspectives, we will lose the face of taking from the past into the present to make our futures. Disaffection and disadvantage, and I believe that education is a fundamental human right, and when it's denied, we can start to see that disaffection affect university and campus life. These are just lives that are no longer with us lives that affect directly or indirectly what I believe we can achieve when we use sport in the arts, which I believe are a fundamental human right in the mental, physical, health, emotional well-being and safeguarding 
of us intergenerationally and society as a whole. It has social, cultural, economic, and even political impact when used in the right and appropriate way. For these young lives, they won't be able to realize their potential because the disaffection and disadvantage of the streets and failed educational attainment can lead to antisocial, gang-related activity and even extremism. And these are all risks that higher education institutions battle with every single day. But I believe that sport and the arts are a vaccine and antidote with a cultural treatment that we all become responsible to and for. The current issues you face might seem overwhelming at times, but for all the universities I've been in over my unique journey in life through sport that's taken me back into society and then back into sport, all of these issues are centered around not only student well-being, but staff well-being, community well-being, because you exist not in a bubble or a vacuum, but you are symbols of consistent presence in the everyday lives on campus and beyond campus. But how important is the civic role of universities in addressing these equitably diverse and inclusive challenges? While universities are vital to their places, they also need the active support of their communities in these turbulent and challenging times. Lord Kerslake said that when he led the Manifesto for Public Engagement. And this statement, these three statements, I think provide something that starts to develop a new ecosystem, a new holistic and integrated approach, because we're gonna to have to pull all of our resources efficiently, effectively, and impactfully in order to ensure that the final paragraph of being committed to develop, managing, supporting, and delivering public engagement for the benefit of staff, students, and the public and to sharing what we learn about effective practice. Because it's not about best practice anymore, it's about effective and efficient and impactful, relevant, authentic activism and impact. Story, that's me, potential bad boy made good, the product of a post-war Windrush migration. Father died at seven, my mother, a young widow, moved to the east end of London, and I developed two chips on my shoulder, the color of my skin and my accent. My accent saw me adapt very quickly to my East End environment. My skin was non-negotiable, so I learned to live with it. The East End of London had the National Front at that particular moment in time. That indifference meant I had to learn to defend myself. So I went to a local leisure center and sport and the arts were my escape from my disaffection and disillusionment. I was brought up in a community, I was shaped by a community. I left school because they didn't want me because I always had something to say. I was aware of the world that was beginning to shape me. I was autodidactic. I was shaped by my environment and the people that I came into contact with. My emotional intelligence was highly honed and that sense of soft skills that we apply now became very effective engagement tools. All boys schools, I believe, I'm a great believer in co-education because we spent all of our time bunking off to the all girls school. So how do we make best use of time? How do we become more creative in our curriculum? Well, I discovered karate and it changed my life. It gave me self-discipline. It gave me the means that I could protect myself and defend myself. I learned that I could channel that mental, physical, emotional health and well-being. I could have targets and goals. And then all of a sudden I could compete. I learned a language, travel broadened the mind. I achieved gold medals. There is no greater honor to represent your country and lead a Great Britain team. That's what I did in the 80s. But in those 80s, the communities I came from were rioting. But I never forgot that incredible journey from street to stadium, occasionally to rostrum, and back to the streets. In everything, I was able to convert and convey how sport could help me and could help others. And I moved into public life after the riots, after challenging to then Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, that sport was not for the unclean, but it was for all. I'm a product of sport for all, in all its equitably diverse and inclusiveness. I then went into sports administration and sat as the only face in the crowd of a culturally homogenous group think. And I want you to remember, it is not just about the look, it's about the feel, it's about the commitment. 
It's about diversity in knowledge, competence, ethics, commitment, values, objectives. The journey on the way to Hollywood, work that one out, saw me go from London to Manchester, a city I'd won my first under 21 All-Stars heavyweight title. The Manchester 2000 Olympic bid, where I became an ambassador to promote those 2000 games and secure them for Britain. And in that time, a 14 year old schoolboy was shot dead on the streets of Moss Side. His name was Benji Stanley, January the 2nd. Months later, it was Stephen Lawrence. And in quick succession time, it was James Bulger. Things happened in threes. I'd been part of Geldof's Live Aid in 1985. He did it with the arts, I did it with sport. I launched a youth charter because I felt sport for all had become sport for a few. It had not done for me what it should have been doing for those young people now who wanted a name in life, who wanted an alternative curriculum to life. At one of the cathedrals of sport, Wembley, we launched that youth charter. And sport unified people from all backgrounds, walks of life. Schools, public, private sector, third sector, higher education. And we brought together a movement that saw sportsmen and women, and by the way, I'm the one on the left, but all of these famous faces of sport all came together and the scroll became a symbol. It became sportsmen and women who I might argue without sport could have been at a majesty's pleasure rather than a leisure. The University of Crime and the University of Life are paths that should be a choice. At the moment, I believe it's a single path and we need to give a diversity of choice, hope and opportunity. What do we do? We engage young people through sport, art, culture and digital technology. We equip them with mental, physical and emotional life skills and resilience. Then we empower them with the aspiration to further and higher education, employment and entrepreneurship. That is the ecosystem. To do it in any other way is short termism and fails in its covenant and in its authenticity. Proven, pioneered, campaigned, broker. That's all what we've done despite of, but because of. In everything we do, we found that it was still a fragmented space. So how could we look at what I'd seen in many universities that I've worked with over many years, where I've been asked to come in and talk about behavioral performance and how it can affect the student life experience, the staff experience, can we get the staff right, the students will benefit, but more importantly, go beyond the campus into the community. So we developed a community campus model. A community campus was made up of a number of facilities where young people could go. Once they were in those facilities, they would need something to do. And they became social coaches, extraordinary people who can build trust, confidence and respect through sport, art and cultural activity. They could provide the all important societal glue that is missing at this present moment in time that would be equally inspirational in a lecture theater, on a campus and beyond the campus. Almost a 24 seven summer school experience where your facilities become dormant, active through that period of time, but little gaps, what I believe becomes community, interactive and human face time. The social coaches is the biggest currency because they bring authentic life experience. They bring an empathy, not sympathy, because that can be tokenistic and patronizing. We decided that we needed impact that was in education, health, citizenship, environment. You'll see college, universities, employment and entrepreneurship, all within that inner circle of somewhere to go, something to do and someone to show them. Global benchmarks, like the UN 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. Because if you have a model, if you have a cultural framework, you can engage, equip and empower. You can then have the quantitative and qualitative data of outputs and outcomes empirical research, all that innovative creativity that you have at your disposal in your universities that can support collaboration and partnership, register and record the youth activities that, are, that show behavioral lifestyle trends, but can map, track and measure the impact of what you do and how you do it. Planning, preparing and delivering the activities, but all in that ecosystem that becomes truly sustainable and impactful a legacy opportunity for all. Because that ultimately has to be the authentic way forward. If we're going to really meet what your, your environment is allowing over these next number of days, co-creation, 
Well, I'm looking for collaboration because none of the inequalities that we face at this present moment in time can see change unless we see diversity of movement, identity, background. Whatever you look like, wherever you come from, whatever you believe in, whatever your life choices, who you love, who you like, ultimately, there must be that collective respect, trust and confidence in that notion that we all have an equal right to hope and opportunity. I made reference to UN Sustainable Development Goals. We cannot exist in Youth Chart unless we have collaboration and partnership. It is both the reason that we succeed and do not succeed. And while we've seen too many lives lost, not only to the violence, not only to the extremism, but to the universities of crime, in the social, cultural and economic impact that negatively sees us face stark economic times. Everyone's looking at the bottom line and the budget. So I make a socio-economic argument, a socio-economic case. But the UNESCO Chairs Programme and Unity Twin Networks promotes international inter-varsity cooperation and networking to enhance institutional capacity through knowledge sharing and collaborative work. That's where we're taking this effort. That's where we're taking this model. 700 plus institution in 116 countries tells me there has to be positivity and opportunity from all that we face. The benefits, in my view and humble experience, are extraordinary. If we can truly collaborate and work together, we can improve public and civic engagement for staff, student and community. We can improve safeguarding for staff, students and community. We can improve health and well-being for staff, students and community. And we can improve financial resilience for staff, student and community. But that whole ecosystem becomes a win-win-win for everybody. Sport in the arts becomes a vaccine and antidote. It becomes the ecosystem holistic in its integrated policy strategies and really does help us re-engage, re-equip and re-empower whatever post-COVID, whatever Black Lives Matter, whatever all lives matter, because we all bleed red. And at the end of the day, we need to understand what this will all represent going forward. To suggest to you that being bold, creative and adventurous through tragedy could inspire a movement of sport for development for peace that would take me around the world again to complement my competitive career would reinforce the very essence of what I'm sharing with you today. And hopefully in what I theme interactively active and actively interactive gives you the emotional resilience and confidence that you'll be valued, that you will be able to know that you are not on your own, that it is not the responsibility of a director or a pro vice chancellor of equality, diversity and inclusion. It is everybody's responsibility because it is only then when we can treat one another as how we wish to be treated. These are some of the universities who have shaped what I've shared with you this morning. Our call to action in 2019 was launched by Baroness Doreen Lawrence, who I work with, who's a fearless campaigner for all things unequal, who still fights for justice for her son, Stephen. Lord Sebastian Coe, Chairman of London 2012, joined me and our call to action was 10 cities, 10,000 social coaches, 1,000 in each city, with up to a million lives impacted upon, for the good. But we needed the higher education institutions. You have the students, you have the potential future leaderings and leaders. You have the innovation, the creativity, the ability to be a consistent presence when others come and go. Your authenticity, but your ecosystem sees benefits that I believe cannot be overlooked and cannot be ignored. The challenge is too great for you to not play your part. Many of you are doing it so well, but we can always do better. We always look for raising the bar in excellence. And that excellence is something that I believe is something that we can now take and translate into real tangible opportunity. HE for good was a term I used at the CUC conference in October 2019, where Baroness Lawrence joined me and we presented the art of the possible. Last year, on March 23rd, the Youth Charter was to mark its 27th anniversary and our plans and our call to action had to be shelved. 
we've used that time since then positively. Because since that time, lockdown has seen more lives lost, more lives disaffected. COVID-19 and Black Lives Matter has just awoken everyone to what is required, what is needed. Sarah Everett's loss of life, tragically and recently, has shown that as, when we see collectivism, those in power, institutionally, must respond to the will of the people. You are that people. You are the effective change. That is why I'm appealing to you, from wherever you are, in your remote spaces, that you engage with us, you collaborate with us, and you take forward what we will be presenting in a number of days where we will mark on March 23rd, our 28th year. Because I'm always consistently challenged as to why we shouldn't give up. By the way, we do this as a completely volunteer effort. But now we need to invest. And the greatest investment is in the talent, potential, and the collaborative might that you all represent. I'd like you to think about Birmingham 2022, when the Commonwealth re-engages with Britain and Britain with the Commonwealth. I'm the deputy chair of Birmingham 2022. And what I've presented to you is possible because our philosophy and vision will not change. The late President Mandela asked me to use sport and the arts to heal the racial tensions of the post-apartheid South Africa. So this really comes to you as an extraordinary journey of what the art of the possible can be with all the challenges that are faced. Madiba believed that sport has the power to change the world. I believe it in its broadest possible experience and its broadest possible benefit. So sport is an order of chivalry, a code of ethics and aesthetics, recruiting its peoples from all classes. Sport is a truce in an era of antagonism and conflicts. It is the respite of the gods in which fair competition ends in respect and friendship, Olympiaism. Sport is education, further or higher education, the truest form of education, because it develops character. Sport is culture because it enhances life and most importantly does so for those who have the least opportunity to feast on it. Rennie Mahu, the former director of UNESCO, inspired me with those words 27 years ago when I was looking for something that would embrace and encompass what we needed to be about in the Youth Charter. However, for those who doubt what vision can achieve and mission and objectives and values, Vision without action is a dream. Action without vision is merely passing time. Vision with action can change the world. All I'm asking you to do, if you've heard these words, you've felt these words, and for all those lives that have been lost, they were priceless, just contact us, question us, challenge us, become that fifth sector of higher education for good. And I believe we can make real and impactful change. There are three words we use in the Youth Charter. Please, sorry, and thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you for feeling. Please act in whichever way you can as a collective. And the thank you will come from those you would least expect to hear it from. Jeff Thompson pause. Thank you so much, Jeff, for that. Um, that that was truly inspiring, and that thanks of inspiration been echoed very many times in the chat box here. Um, excellent, powerful words, some real food for thought for us as we move forward. And um, there are some questions in here. I noticed somebody said every time I've got a question, Jeff goes on to answer it for me. So, <laughs> um, which is a that's that's a sense of a really really well crafted uh, presentation for us. Um, there's there is a question here which says inspiring keynote. Thank you. Uh, what do you think will be the priorities for our work in in higher education um, with young people post COVID? I do think this idea of, you know, we're, we're going through a kind of experience at the moment. We're going to have we're going to have youngsters coming into university who've had the most disrupted year of education ever in memory. We've got first year students who have gone through a, a really unusual experience. We've got the, the future students, um, 
Yeah, so what do you think the priorities for our work will be with young people post-COVID? I think the priorities for the students are equally for the staff, are equally for your stakeholders. I really do. When we were in South Africa, when I first went to a township, these townships had no money, had no grants, had nothing. But they had Ubuntu. It was by me, we become we. And I saw extraordinary people doing extraordinary things with extraordinarily nothing. But they brought a collectivism. And I think we really do have to acknowledge that everyone has been affected mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually. It has been an extraordinary time. Things will never be the same. So that provides the art of the possible to look at things creatively. We're looking at new curriculums. We're looking at new ways of doing things. But as you bring those students in, I think that's where, for example, the social coaches become extraordinary as an experience. We used opportunities of bringing action learning, real life challenges, bringing diverse perspectives and experiences together, staff, students, lecturers, the community. And they all took rotation in addressing the challenging themes. And by the end of the experience, and that was in a day, it was in a week, it was in a term, they became the change agents. And I think we have to look at it in that holistic and integrated manner. So everybody walks away with new, what I call emotional armor. That emotional armor builds resilience. And what we need is life resilience. And I think the rest will take care of itself because we've learned one disaffected mind. My sons went to school with Salman Abedi in Manchester. I looked at where he became disaffected. He got switched off. Someone didn't care. He went to a university. He, he dropped out of university. And he went to the university of life. And it was the wrong lesson. It was the wrong plan. So I, I'm a great advocate. The late, great Muhammad Ali. We do work with the Muhammad Ali Center in Louisville, Kentucky. His legacy was about empowering women, men respecting women. So the Flood Like a Butterfly social coach leadership program was delivered in Moss Side and um, Smoketown in Louisville. We've mm -hmm. seen what the power of bringing people together, building emotional resilience, bringing mutual respect and collaboration, and then I believe anything is possible. So as they return, new tools, new ways of doing things. We're really going to have to think out of the box and no longer tick a box, but create a virtuous cycle rather than what I believe is a sort of siloed cycle. Mm -hmm. Oh, fantastic. Very moving, actually, bringing all of those things together. Could you just tell me, Jeff, a little bit more, what, what do these social coaches do? What's what's the difference between a social coach and a coach? A, so, a social coach is a teacher, a fireman, a policeman, um, a businessman, a lecturer, um, a sporting coach, an artistic, creative um, energy, a mentor. What I learned was there were fantastic people doing fantastic things with young people, mm. but we weren't doing it as a diversely reflective group of individuals. And it was very much inspired by the people who shaped me when I grew up mm. in the East End of London, the coaches that I had in so many different ways from so many different backgrounds and walks of life, and then seeing them in their communities and the South Africa experience and many other communities that I visited where in the main you saw extraordinary women showing the emotional intelligence, the lateral thinking. By the way, everyone, I'm a self-confessed mummy's boy, so don't be offended. I have that <laughs> software. Differential would be Apple and, and, and um, Microsoft or PC. But what I'm saying is, ultimately, the social coach is about building a new covenant and relationship with our young and in our communities. Mm -hmm. It's a two-hour-a-week commitment. In one university where we delivered an approach of this kind, we were able to identify 100,000 hours if everybody contributed, students and staff. If you take that into a community, you can change the community and you can change the world. So everyone talks about money. Yes, economics are important, but isn't it important when you've got that social currency of leadership all brought together? And again, in South Africa, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission I have all the volumes of it, the Mau Mau reconciliation of Rwanda. They'd spent hundreds of millions on it and it didn't work. They yeah. used a traditional reconciliation. The village got together, the wise sat by the tree, the, the experiences were expressed in wrongs that were righted. But to see Tutsis 
um, and Hutus now live together after mm -hmm. reconciling what many people said was impossible. And what did they do? They found the cultural bridge. Mm -hmm. So I use the passion of sport and the arts and cultural activity. That becomes the tools of engagement for social coaches because I believe it's the only thing that unifies us, equally that can divide us. But in the main, as of the last year, I've seen sport as a force for good. So I see Birmingham 2022 taking volunteers and social coaches, a network of um, for, um, universities, all becoming that HE for good. Because I think if you become one powerful collective force, for me, it becomes a long journey that would have a destination point that when that legacy flame goes out in those games, there is a return back to our community, strengthened, strengthened emboldened, mm. but with a real sense of purpose to what the art mm. of the possible can be. Yes, you're absolutely right. I remember being in Stellenbosch in Cape Town at a conference in 2001 or 2002, and I just could not get over how all the, the black people and the white people working alongside each other and you know without animosity without all of the things you might have expected and it it was magic it felt like magic actually and and i think what you're saying also is um you know it's about building social confidence and social capital for these people isn't it really it's a social, yeah that's what i take yeah. away from that jeff Alison, it's a okay, social economic get, construct I'm sorry it's i'll a, get back to these, some more of these questions in here for you um there's one here um, from Kim saying, you mentioned the sustainable development goals, um, really important. What do you think universities should do to have a broader and more integrated commitment to social and environmental sustainability to support inclusivity and diversity? Oh, there's quite a lot in there. There was. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, would, I honestly would say, please visit the Youth Charter website, look at what we've done, critique it, add value to it, it's a model, it's a framework, it's an impact matrix, it builds the collaboration, it provokes creative thinking, and it starts to shape how what I've seen, I've always been intimidated and inspired when I go to university. I was always supposed to go to university, but the view is I wouldn't survive and I'd either be kicked out or drop out. But what I'm saying is, you have so much available to you, and you all do so much good work, but as a collectively socioeconomic ecosystem, I think that that integrated and sometimes diverse effort, and yes, that's what universities are about, creating that innovation, creating that diversity of thought, knowledge, wisdom, and experience. But if you bring a bit of it together, and that's all we've done with Community Campus and the, mm. the cultural framework and the social coaches and the YouthWise program. The YouthWise program is sport, art, culture, and digital education, mm. but with the fundamentals of read, write, and count. 95% of inmates at Her Majesty's pleasure, cannot read, cannot write. There's something there that says education in its truest form from primary, secondary, further to higher education. But that higher education, I've always, you're always seen as a highbrow. You're always seen as almost societally removed. And it's almost seen as philanthropic, charitable act. No, this is the essence of what you do now, in my view. And I think mm -hmm. that's how you bring everything together, model it, frame it, and take mm -hmm. it forward. Great answer. Thank you very much. We're on something very practical here now, Jeff, which is preempting what the management might say, the senior management might say, which is um, talking about signing up to the youth charter. Um, has it helped, do you think, with student recruitment at the universities that have signed up to it? Or could you tell us a bit more about the financial arguments for adopting the charter? Because I'm preempting, it says a senior management question here. What's um, the return on investment? What's the business case? I the, think is the, the question. <laughs> the, return, the return on investment, recruiting students, retaining students. I know what student <laughs> dropout can represent to the bottom line. I know what um, delving into and be seeing as so many institutions want to be seen to have a student currency mm. body and I think just representation of their commitment to all things equal, diverse and inclusive. This is a socioeconomic considered model. The top slicing of existing resources used in a targeted, focused and evidenced way can restore, rebuild and even, I believe, refresh the current HE ecosystem where there are obvious challenges. The senior leadership are the ones I go to first because they operate in that ivory tower. Mm. 
I've, I've been part of that. I've retired, chaired a university gov, um, board. I've seen what it represents. They didn't want these proposals. They thought it was too much time for too less a return. Mm. But it's not until you go on the, the, the DLR or you go and walk the campus or you see students on one meal a day, the student maintenance grant. These are all things Glasgow University have presented as part of the Commonwealth Feds of Government in 2018. I took the Commonwealth Roadshow. Glasgow University acknowledged the reparation or the acknowledgement of the investment of mm. the slave profits into their institution and they have made reparation in the 21st century. These are areas, they're not uncomfortable now questions. I think they're questions we can answer. And I think the socioeconomic argument can be well established. Universities just have to reset their business model or their operating model. Mm -hmm. But the, re the recruitment of students, the retention of students, but more importantly, their ability to exist and to maintain a presence in the communities in which they operate I think sees them as the new fifth sector. The third sector were the, the charitable sector. We were told the fourth sector was schools. The fifth sector is HE. And I think you get a far greater return on that socioeconomic investment. You have sporting and artistic facilities. You have design creati creativity and innovation. You have lecturers. You have everything there. So it wouldn't take a lot to bring about something of really impactful change. It wouldn't take a lot to attract the type of so the business apprenticeship levy, have we used that effectively? I do not believe we have. Mm. If we use that really effectively, if we reset that and we lobbied government, there is a resource that I believe adds to the ecosystem. So I believe there is a socioeconomic case for the charter or else I would mm. never have presented it to you today or continue to fight and advocate for it. It's, it's, it's sad in many respects that that question still crops up because I've been working in the field of equality, diversity and inclusion in higher education for 30 years now. And I thought we got over having to make the business case. There's a moral case, there's an ethical case, there's a social case. There are, you know, there are lots of other cases, but um, I have sympathy with the question um, coming to you. Um, here's an interesting question, Jeff. Um, it's from Els. I agree that sport is truly powerful as a force for positive change. How do you work with or what is available for students who cannot get involved with sports or who prefer not to? Um, yeah. As, as I said, Maybe you don't. <laughs> sport, sport in its artistic, its cultural. I always liken it to an opening ceremony of a major games. If you look at the opening ceremony, the closing ceremony, that's what the youth charter is all about. There is something right. there for everybody. I believe everyone has a gift. Everyone has a talent. And if you can tap into that gift and that talent, you can unlock their potential. I've always been amazed that the really, most universities use sport and the arts as a means of attracting their students. But I think they could do a little bit more work on how they engage them as they, as they join in their student life experience or embark on that experience. You know, that's the time where they're feeling vulnerable. That's the time where they're having to make decisions, being one step removed from the family unit or the relationship unit that they've, they, they will have um, transferred from to new community, new relationships. Um, in, in China, autocratic, authoritarian, that it may be. I was there in um, XJTLU, um, in Shizhou, 